as soon as we saw this, we were really excited. Uh, this was my dude back in the day at ESPN, yeah. the early years. It is Jamal Mashburn, Kentucky legend, NBA legend. Yeah. And uh, and at one point, like he was my dude back in the day. So what's up? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. It's good to see you, man. Um, it's been a it's been a long time. Uh, life has been good, man. I remember when we had our radio show, we were at the cutting edge at the time, man. You know, three hours on a Sunday or a Saturday. I can't remember it was. But, man, I love you, man. It's good to connect with you again, man. So here's here's what's funny about um, Jamal, you know, for me, especially, <laughs> too, because like I just started working at ESPN and I'd been around, you know, guys that played at that point because I would been working in Boston mm -hmm. for a few years. So I started at the very beginning of 06. And then, yeah, they gave me this NBA show with Jamal where it was <laughs> early uh, Sunday mornings. And then I would do the baseball show. I go back to yeah. the hotel and then I come back and do the baseball show the same day. And I look, I loved it. But we would always be at the residence inn in Southington. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cause that was like the sneak tip upgrade if you were like, oh, give me, the, give me the residence inn. Um, because it used to be the clarion that smelled like <laughs> dead people that was directly yeah. across the street, but that's been upgraded. I think it's a, a double tree now. So Jamal and I would be like sitting around in these new England winters with just yeah. time to kill. Cause like if I did a show on a Friday. I would just stay cause I didn't want to drive to Boston and come back. And then you guys are usually there two or three days. Yep. So we were bored one day and I decided I was like, Hey, I'm going to start bringing my Xbox, <laughs> yeah. but I only had one controller. So Jamal and I jump in the car and we drive to Walmart Yeah. and Jamal grabs the remote and we're at the checkout line. And I was kind of like, it was obvious I was going to be keeping the controller Yeah. and Jamal turns to me. He's like, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not a big deal, man. Not a big deal. It's uh, only 80 bucks. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Cause then, you know, you were always kind of funny because we'd always talk about like the contracts and all that stuff. And you were just sizing me up in the reality of this situation that I think I was a hundred dollar an hour guy then. <laughs> and that's just when you were on the air and you were like, I'll, I'll pay for this man. Yeah. Because, I got you, know, you. That was still, that was going to be a hit for me. And then we would sit there in our sweatpants and play video games all day waiting to go back over. So Correct. yeah, you were one of the original guys that I, I connected with more yeah. so just because we were stuck there so long. So, yeah, we were stuck there for so long. And then also too, you know, going, if people never been to ESPN, they had the studio side and then you had the radio side, you know what I mean? And we were always bump each to each other, especially the late, what was that NBA show at like one o'clock in the morning or something. And I'll be coming through there and stuff like that. Um, I, I really enjoyed, you're one of the highlights for sure of me working up there to ESPN. You know, there's only a, a couple and you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a good transition because, you know, Jamal's an incredibly smart dude, has had a lot of success, uh, success off the court as well, was was always planning. You know, there was a yeah. lot of stuff that you told me then that I didn't quite understand, but it was like always thinking about your options and planning your next move. It's not so much planning your exit, but when your exit happens, having these other moves. Yeah, Knowing you then and looking back on it, did you even like being in the media? You know, um, no. Yeah, um, I didn't think so. It, it was, um, you know, I was a communication major in college at the University of Kentucky. And um, when I retired in 2005 from the NBA, Turner was TNT was the first person, first group to reach out to me. And I didn't want to do anything after that first year. Um, so then ESPN reached out to me the, the following year and I decided to go ahead and do it to try to put that communication thing to work. Um the thing that I didn't enjoy about the media was the production meetings, you know, um, and how they wanted you to shape the conversation. You know what I mean? It always felt like uh, drama. It always felt like we were even talking about LeBron or something else. And there was so much, much to offer other than just talking about LeBron. But as you get involved in the business, you understand why. You know, the, you have certain draws and different things like that. And it seemed like the content and everything that I was saying became repetitive throughout the whole day. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, because it's do. just yeah. like, you know, it's just constant, the same thing, the same conversation. And, you know, a light bulb went off in my head when they wanted to add, I think it was 50 more dates. I had a 50 day, 50 day contract with them. And after my third year, they wanted to add 50 more dates. So that would have been a hundred. And that I would have to travel from Miami to Hartford. And I pitched them on early on, hey, let me find a sponsor and I can do this remotely. 
And um, they didn't they didn't want to buy into that. Um, but they actually wound up doing it in COVID, essentially, you know, of, of taping people remotely. And that's when I just decided to leave. They weren't thinking very entrepreneurial. And I, I just had so much other stuff going on. I started to look at my calendar and say, well, I'm spending 50 days a year, including travel and prep in order to prepare to go and talk on it. It's too time consuming, you know, and I don't enjoy it that much. And then also one of the philosophies I live by is what does it lead to? Right. You know, what is, what is, am I going to, you know, and at the time I was there with Jalen Rose and I can see Jalen, how he wanted to be there. You know what I mean? He would, he would do any and everything. And I was a little bit more uh, structured with my time. You know what I mean? I mean, you know how it is up there at that place. It's a free for all. And if you don't set boundaries, they won't care about you. But I, I didn't see myself doing that long term at all. I just wanted to put that communications uh, uh, work and see what it looked like on the other side. But what I will say is the benefit that came from that was it allowed other people to transition along with me outside of basketball. And that was important to me because now people weren't just asking me at that time for my autograph because of my career. They were asking me about my opinion on the game because they see me on television talking about it. So that allowed and helped me transition beyond just being an athlete that just wore a jersey to a person that can actually communicate things above and beyond sports. So I do credit um, that ESPN time for allowing people to catch up with my transition, so to speak. What I really liked about what we did is, you know, I was trying to, you know, I was always enamored with anybody that was successful and wanting to know more about them. But I also really just wanted, I wanted honest opinions on players. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, it's hard yeah. for some former players because you look at the media and you're like, all right, even though I'm technically with the media, I don't like align myself yeah. with you guys. Like you're just a yeah. bunch of nerds who never played. Right. So um, I could understand if I had been a pro athlete, I would not like the media because I'd be like, you got this wrong. This is inaccurate, you know, but I don't think you want to be somebody who's just a complete jerk to everybody all the time. Yeah. But there would be players that would come in. And say, this has happened with coaches probably more so than even with players that would come in acting like they weren't really working there when they yeah. worked there. And what I always liked about you is that you didn't have any hangups. Like if I asked you a question about a player, you were going to tell me exactly how you felt. You weren't going to play this role of like, hey, I'm a former player, so I always have Correct. to stick with all these guys. So the reason I bring that up is that when you see the content now that is so mm -hmm. different and how fast this has moved. And all these former NBA players with podcasts, uh, and you see it now. Like I know you don't feel left out, but no, are yeah. are you surprised how often? Like, let me just put it this way: There's so many times where I'm like, even though I can put all this time into it, I can't really know if I'm right about everything. What's yeah. going on with the team? Because I'm not around it every day. I'm not actually on the staff or any of that kind of stuff. But then I'll see guys that used to play say shit, and I'm like, well, I'm okay. <laughs> like now, <laughs> yeah. now I'm not that worried about it because I can't believe how crazy some of the opinions get from the guys that actually played. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I actually saw the transition when we were up at ESPN when they were talking about cable and how expensive cable was, and people were cutting the cord um, and getting away, and they were going to be streaming packages and different things like that. Um, um, so I started to notice that players also, along with social media, Instagram, Twitter, and all these different things, they wanted to control their voice and their narrative. And they didn't want it. Usually that voice was controlled by the beat writer yeah. of the team, right. you know, or the marketing agent or whatever it may be, or the sponsor would contribute to that as well. So, you know, once social media um, started to arrive and now you can have direct access to the player and he can have his own opinion. Um, I think it had at that time is a little bit more authentic. Now it's a little bit more commercialized at this particular point where people are just getting people on their podcasts or creating these podcasts. They really don't have any structure. You know, they, they, they don't really don't have uh, the best thing that they do have is their contacts and um, their relationship with current players. That's the currency that most of these guys have. And, and you can be a little bit more outlandish. And I think the pro athlete has recognized nowadays that, you know, with, with the 
But the cable channels and the news channels have always recognized that drama and outland just talk sales, you know, that click sells. So the further and further you can be outside of the norm, you're going to draw people to your particular landing page or your, to your particular platform. Um, I think the one thing that they have to be conscious of, and if I were them um, getting involved in, in media, you know, I, I, I would have a background in journalism. And, and structure it in, 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 a, in a way to make yourself unique, to ask the right questions, uh, to be thoughtful, uh, uh, to, to pull the right information. Because sometimes I watch guys and I'm like, well, dang, why you ain't expand on that? Why you ain't ask a follow up question? You know what I mean? Or or take them down this particular path. So I think we're at a crossroads now. And I think with gambling and, and, and all the promotion that is behind that, you're going to see a lot more podcast platforms pop up with former players. But then I think you'll have the uh, slimming effect where the ones that are serious about it and really work on that craft, they'll be the ones that'll be standing the longest. Let's talk some hoops. You're down in Miami. Uh, obviously, you played for the Heat. You get traded there from Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine you're not even remote. I was going to ask, like, who are you more surprised that's still in the game? Your college coach, Rick Pitino, or Pat Riley still running this organization back when you played for him? Uh, yeah. you know, coming up on 30 years here. But I don't think it's surprising that either are this still plugged into the game you know what i i knew uh, when the first time i met uh rick patino um when i first got a hold of him was five-star basketball camp when he was the head coach of providence college and he used to do these motivational things and teaching clinics at five-star camp where all good players would go to it's like a rite of passage almost you know um he's a lifer man you know he's 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 a lifer man he's he's a um, he'll be coaching. I don't think he'll ever retire. You know what I mean? Um, um, Pat Riley, a little different. The way he's positioned himself with the Miami Heat, he can't afford to retire. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he is the Miami Heat. You know what I mean? So when people think of the Miami Heat, it's a very unique situation where, just like San Antonio, when you think of San Antonio, you think of Greg Popovich. You know, ever since Tim Duncan and David Robinson, Mono Ginobili and Tony Parker have left, have moved on. You think of Greg Popovich. Uh, same thing with Pat Riley. You think of the Miami Heat. You think of Pat Riley. And um, those guys are life for wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm a heat season ticket holder. I sit right there on the floor right in front of Pat Riley. So I come in and say hello to him all the time. Um, he's a lot more calmer and milder. Than he, these days, now that he's not coaching me. Okay, and, but uh, let me let me. What was <laughs> what was the immediate wake up call of like? Okay, I'm not with the Dallas Mavericks anymore. You know, um, you know, interesting story. Um, so this is how I knew I was with the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, when I got to the Dallas Mavericks in 1993 from the University of Kentucky, the Dallas Mavericks were the only team was the last remaining team not to have a charter plane or a private plane. We flew commercial. And at the University of Kentucky, we flew private. So this is how I, <laughs> first, let's lay with that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then when I got to the Miami Heat, and no no shade on the Dallas Mavericks when I was there because they went through a ownership change. Uh, they went from Don Carter to, to um, Ross Perot Jr. Um, a lot of things happened. Um, different coaches, different things like that. The one thing noticeable difference with the Miami Heat was they were a professional organization. It felt like professional basketball. You know, the accountability, uh, um, what's the expectation was laid out uh, for you, uh, the work ethic, all that stuff you were immersed in that Heat culture at that particular time. And it was all about winning at the end of the day. And that's what Pat Riley cared about. As you know, Ryan, um, not a lot of teams are all about winning in the NBA. They talk about it, but they're not really about it going through their actions. And Pat Riley and the Miami Heat are all about winning. It's all about the front of the jersey rather than the back of the jersey. Even though in the NBA you need stars to win games, you have to buy into that Heat culture in order to be successful. When you were there, um, you ended up facing off you get through two rounds you take on jordan the bulls in the eastern conference yeah. finals they'd won 69 games that year so it was yeah. what the 96 97 season correct um i remember just being super locked in in college and just kind of watching all those bulls teams it wasn't like i was rooting for them but you didn't i mean if you were a yeah, basketball fan right yeah uh <laughs> when you know you can't win <laughs> what's that yeah. feeling like 
Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of people throughout Michael Jordan's career who feel gonna gonna understand this feeling. It's almost like, um, how do you say it? You, you almost have to take the approach like you're running a marathon. Seconds, not bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like when place a, a draw. You know what I mean? It's right. it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where you realize, and especially for us when we played the Chicago Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals. I think we won one game. It was 4-1. Yeah, it was. And what was interesting was, you know, Michael Jordan played golf during the day before he played us. So it's kind of like, you know, um, this dude ain't even really thinking about us that much. He's going out in the golf course, but that was just his M.O. They were just he, they were just so great all around with Scotty, Dennis Rodman, and Phil Jackson and dialed in. And Michael Jordan being the greatest of all time, in my opinion. Um, you're always playing for second with him. I mean, ask Hakeem Olajuwon. I'm sure he loves Michael Jordan because if if Michael Jordan didn't retire, Houston Rockets would not have two championships for sure. I don't know if Jordan gets eight straight, though. He may have been exhausted from that. Um, I don't but- know, man. I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, to put it like this, have you ever seen a guy leave a sport, play another sport, and come back, and then five games later get 55? I mean, I, I, there's a possibility he might have got eight in a row, man. I, I can't rule it out, but just knowing <laughs> how exhausted they were in the third season of the second three, Pete, but then yeah. you go, okay, but what if you threw in two more prior to this that it's just automatically like eight in a row? Like, I don't, I don't like suggesting that he's incapable of doing something on a basketball court, but going back and watching the beginning of the third season of the second repeat it felt like they were yeah. kind of like mentally on fumes but just the toughness of that team like and I, I think that was one of the things about your heat run that i liked i didn't think you were more talented you had those no. battles with the knicks but you you certainly were tough enough and i've always wondered like when i'm watching great teams now and i don't like the dismissive like everything's soft now mm-hmm. and there's no hard fouls i mean the guys yeah. are so much more talented when it comes to just individual shot making than we've ever seen. It's the evolution of athletes. I've, I've given this speech probably too many times, but getting to that point where it's like, Hey, we actually have a toughness about us that makes us a tougher out despite the gap in talent. Like I know part of it's the heat thing that we've already touched on in Pat Riley, but like, is it, is it Lonzo? Is it all the guys? Like, how do you build that? with it being a real thing as opposed to just something up on a t-shirt or a whiteboard? You know, it, it actually starts with, um, uh, the head guy, um, starts with Pat Riley at the end of the day. And it doesn't start in training camp. It starts with, uh, pre like conditioning throughout the summertime, you know, back in the day, um, I would say few years before I got into the NBA, a lot of guys would get in shape during training camp. But when you play for the Miami Heat, you had to be in shape because you had a conditioning test you had to do. So it, the, the, the mental toughness part uh, to me was instrumental during the summertime or when you're preparing for the season. So everybody had to buy in. And when you hit the training camp, you had to run five seventeens and hit your time and then you're off to practice. I will say, though, that the toughness part, especially the mental part, is more harder than the physical part. And it does grind on you throughout the season, you know, and especially in an NBA season with 82 games, it grinds on you. So to me, it's it's one of those things where you have to have a coach who knows how to pull a lever to take some time off throughout the middle of the season. And one of the things that Pat Riley did, and I think the NBA doesn't allow it now, is I remember one year we had one like, I don't know, it was like 16 in a row or something like that. And then we had lost a game and he just jumped off a cliff. And the captains had to go to Pat Riley like, dude, we won 16 in a row. You acting like we were 0-16. We just lost one game. So that following year, Pat Riley changed his MO a little bit, was still tough on us, but he would throw in like little perks. Like he would uh we were in, I forgot where we were at. We were playing somewhere on the West Coast and we had a two days in between. And mid-flight, that dude was like, we're going to Vegas. And he, he rerouted the plane to Vegas, 
took us to the hotel. Everybody has their own villa. Do what you got to do for 24 hours. We're practicing. Get back on that plane. All she wrote. And um, I think the NBA outlawed that perk after they heard that part of it. Um, but um, um, he understood by listening to his players and especially a veteran group of guys of you can can't have the gas pedal all the way down to 90 miles per hour. You can back it off to 65 sometimes and let the guys kind of recover a little bit and just that that mental grind. But it wears on you after a while, and especially back in those 90s and early 2000s it, it was a uh, defensive basketball it, it was half court basketball at its best it was physical not to say it's not physical now just a different type of physicality now but you know you had to be on your p's and q's and we were all about winning the championship that was the focus it wasn't getting to the eastern conference finals it wasn't making it to the playoffs it wasn't about the atlantic division title or anything like that that was a part of it um, and goals you had to reach in order to get to the ultimate goal of winning the championship. But unfortunately for that group that we had, we Michael Jordan was in that era. What was Alonzo like as a teammate? Um, Alonzo, one thing about Alonzo, Alonzo as a teammate, he was tough. Um, Alonzo, he could be he could be difficult to deal with sometimes. You know what I mean? He could be booty and stuff like that. But that's just a part of it. I mean, but. When he got on that court, there was nobody else that I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with. He came to play every night. And his motor at that size, 6'11", what he can do shot blocking wise. Um, you know, I enjoyed him as a teammate. When we get on the bus, he would sit at the last row and I would sit right in front of him. So we would have conversations and different things. So I got to know him on a, a much uh, deeper level. Um Great teammate, would do anything for you, um, always has a, a great advice for you. I remember Lonzo would drink like these gallons of waters, man. He'd be like, Jamal, you got to drink water, man. I'm like, well, you like, a, I mean, okay, Mr. Fitness guy. You know I mean? <laughs> so, so, but he was, he was awesome. He was awesome to be around. I still see him. He sits right next to Pat Riley because he's with the, with the Heat um, a staff or an organization and stuff like that. And what's interesting is, all those players that I played with from Tim Hardaway, Alonzo Mourning, just PJ Brown, Vashawn Leonard. I'm watching, I've known Timmy Jr. since he was a little, little ball kid at our practices with a, where his head was bigger than the basketball, you know? And I know also uh, Trey Mourning and I see him at the games, went to Georgetown, played a little bit of professional basketball. But what's special is that how old you're getting and all the kids that have grown up that you watch since they were small become men. Awesome time. Well, that's a good transition. Uh, your son's at New Mexico. Um, yeah. I know he started at Minnesota, so it's his, his fourth year in. I know he's a Brewster Academy too. Like yeah. what was the ex experience like for you? Now, look, w when you were recruited, it was, it was, it was a different level of attention. Correct. It was also yeah. a different era, but what's it like for you watching your son hope to have NBA aspirations and, and all of it, man. Yeah. He'll, he'll get an opportunity. Um, don't know if it's NBA or overseas, but he will be playing for money at some point. You know, uh, we haven't decided if he's going to, uh, take a fifth year, they're still in the hunt for the tournament. So I kind of let that kind of play out a little bit. Um, you know, what's been interesting is his trajectory and how much he's improved. Um, Jay, um, you know, I had him in a school down in South Florida. You know, he played varsity as an eighth grader and different things like that. His sophomore year, he averaged about 28 points a game. And I challenged him. I said, son, I love you, man, but you ain't that good. You know what I mean? Uh, so Now, did he you know, think, like, look, if you're 15 and you're scoring 28 and he's got your last name, like there's yeah. there's probably a time there where, it, you know, it's 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 a balance of I want him to be confident but I also like, hey, your dad was taller. So yeah, yeah, know, he's, like. yeah, he's six two. And you know, one thing I do give him credit for is that, you know, I try to keep him away from the game as as long as possible. He started, I want to say, at ten years old, which now is late for a lot of kids. A lot of kids are starting at three. You know what I mean? Dribbling the ball. I put him in everything else besides basketball. He came to me and said he wanted to play it, and um, we took that journey. And one thing I will say about him, he's very competitive. And the thing that I kind of stress to him is that we are going to seek out the best possible competition and we're always going to play up. So when it was the opportunity for him 
um, when he was at that school in uh, Miami, it's called Gulliver. And I challenged him. I said, I think it's time for you to go to a prep school outside the uh, outside of Florida, because basketball is a little different in Florida. It's much more of a football state, especially in Miami, down in Dade County and Broward County, much more football. Um, so I said, you want to go to Brewster Academy? We looked at IMG. We looked at Mount Verde. And he said, yeah, he seeks out competition. You know what I mean? He, I, I had him playing, you know, when he was 15, he played 15s on the Under Armour circuit. And then I moved him up to uh, 17s on the Under Armour circuit. And then he jumped to the Nike circuit at 17 years old as a 2020 kid, learned so much. And, you know, I think for me, I have to strike the balance between being a dad and also a guy that has a resume that played college basketball at a high level and played professional basketball at a high level. So I approach it from the standpoint where I'm here if you need me. I'll help guide you along the journey, but you're the guy in the driver's seat and this is your journey. And, you know, don't compare yourself to me. He never does. He just has to be the best version of himself. He's probably a better scorer than I was and a better shooter than I was as a kid because I had nobody to teach me the game or mechanics. I worked strictly with him on his mechanics when he was a young kid. So he has some advantages that I didn't have, but, you know, I also grew to be 6'8 and he's 6'2". Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, six, eight, yeah, blame, six, two. Yeah, blame his mother. Blame blame my ex-wife. Don't blame me. <laughs> well, there's a little tone in there. We're gonna, we may just move on to the next question. Uh, one of the things that I always like was I was asking you about like the business side and, you know, I know yeah. you had all these investments and everything. You didn't have like a straightforward agent, right? No. Mm -mm. No, I had a... Um, How'd you handle that? So when I first got, um, was about to leave early, uh, one of the mandates that Coach Patino had, he was like, okay, Jamal, we're going to uh, research or interview four agents. And by the and way, Rick told you to leave, right? He told you yeah. you can't come back to Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not that he didn't want me to come well, back. sure. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? I think me and Rick struck a relationship up on honesty. And that was the main thing that I wanted to kind of, as the laying foundation for me and his relationship was honesty. Whatever it is, let's sit down and have a conversation about it. Let's chat about it. And that's unique for a kid that's 17 years old going to college to have a coach that's willing to have that type of relationship with you. And one of the things when I got, you know, was about to sign with the University of Kentucky, I said, hey, you got to let me know when it's my time to leave. If I'm a four-year player, I'm a four-year player, all good. But if I can leave early in that, let me know. And he held his word. And he always looked at it as, what's the best interest of the player? The program was going to be, the program when I came, we were rebuilding and we established it. So he understood that he can get other recruits to come in and everything like that to replace me. And Antoine Walker came in later and different things like that. But Coach Patino sat me in his office after I came back from the first dream team experience and we worked out against them and beat them the first day and they kicked our butts the rest of the six days. And he said, Jamal, you're going to be no less than the fourth overall pick in the following year's draft, which is after my junior year. And he said, after that, we're going to sign uh, an agent and we're going to do a business manager. So after we lost in the final four to the Fab Five in New Orleans, Coach Patino flew back with us and the whole team on that. I think it was that Monday or Tuesday because we actually watched the championship game and we had interviews set up. Um, I chose a business manager who's today is still my business partner. He's no longer my business manager. After two years of that, we became partners and we grew a portfolio of businesses from car dealerships, waste management to fast food restaurants and different things like that. Um, and then I went through the agent process. I hired an agent and um, he came to me and was like, um, well, what do you think you want? And I was like, you know. I want 30 million. And he looked at me like 30 million. Then he went to the Dallas Mavericks and negotiated with them and came back with 19 and a half. Right. And I'm like, well, we're a little bit far apart. And that previous year, Jimmy Jackson was selected fourth overall by the Dallas Mavericks and he got 19. So I'm like, dude, you know, you gonna give me $500,000 more than Jimmy Jackson. I mean, it's supposed to be a significant bump from that. So I let him go. And then uh, my business manager at the time, I said, can you go in there and represent me? He wasn't an agent or anything like that. And he came back with 33 and a half. 
Yeah, because there was no rookie scale back then. <laughs> correct, right, correct. There was right. no rookie scale. You could sign a like a ten year deal, but you would have options. You know what I mean? The, yeah, that was the Glenn out. Robinson thing. Like the correct. Glenn Robinson one was, I think, the last one where they were like, "Okay, this is this is out correct. of control." Correct. Uh, which you know, whatever we can debate it all we want. But one of my favorite parts of of your story is is the last extension. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want me to tell that one? Okay. Yeah. So so I'm in I'm in Charlotte, right? And um. So you're with I'm Miami like, three years, they trade you. They trade me, and they trade me in the uh, in the summertime. And I'm actually headed to a concert called the Up and Smoke Tour with uh, uh, Dr. Dre and all those guys. They were performing in Fort Lauderdale. And it uh, comes across the ticker that I've been traded to the Charlotte Hornets. And I'm like, wow, okay, um, that's interesting. Didn't get a phone call or anything. And eventually, Pat Riley called me and different things like that and said to me, you know what, I think I'm going to regret this down the road. And he actually did because we swept them in the playoffs the following year. Um, so I get to Charlotte. You started Paul scoring Silas's, again, too. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had freedom then. You know what yeah. I mean? I was no longer the third uh, the third wheel on a team that only can score 88 points. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, you're scoring. <laughs> I was a jumps a little bit. Um, so I um, I get in there. And you know how you're working out in the in the preseason and stuff like that. A lot of guys coming back. I'm playing pickup basketball. Paul Silas tells me, he's like, hey, listen, you got the handcuffs off. Let's play now. I start playing. Two weeks go by. I walk into uh, Bob Bass's office. And at the time, he was the president of uh, basketball operations. He said, hey, Jamal, how you doing? What do you want to talk about? So I just knocked on his door. I'm, I'm still in sweat gear, like, you know, just sweating, go off the court. I said, Bob. You like me? He's like, yeah. I was like, I like you. He's like, yeah. I want maximum years and maximum dollars. And he said, okay. <laughs> that was it. And then uh, I called my uh, uh, business partner at the time. 24 hours, it was done. Did you pay a commission <laughs> on that? No. <laughs> no. Okay. He's my partner, man. <laughs> here's, here's the other one. Um, were you hurt when you asked for the max deal? No, I wasn't. I wasn't hurt at that time. Um, I had gotten my first micro fracture surgery was on my left knee, and that was my second. No, my third year. Third in year, Dallas. right? With Dallas. Yeah, my third year is the Dallas Mavericks. I was. I was healthy. I really got healthy um, with the Miami Heat. That's where I got healthy. Pat Riley was instrumental in that. Uh, he was like Jamal. I know your knee is bothering and different things like that. You know, let's get the proper rehab for you. So he was very instrumental in that. He was actually the first person to introduce me uh, to a personal trainer that traveled with me. You know, Pat Riley was ahead of his time, you know, on, on that part of it. So I took that trainer with me to um, Charlotte and he traveled with me and he was basically my rehab guy. So I wasn't hurt at that particular time. Uh, and then actually, if you look it up, 11th and MVP uh, at 30 years old and your first all-star. Yeah, you know, uh, and that's after micro fracture surgery, man. And um, that was 90s. my tenth year. 90s. That was my tenth year. Yeah, <laughs> and people don't realize how that impacted my game. If you watch my games when I got drafted, I would attack the basket and different things like that. But once I had that surgery, it was just I had no explosiveness, so I had to become more of a mid range guy, uh, back you down, fade away, different things like that, and be able to use my ball handling to get around people because I couldn't. I could no longer just explode by people. So, you know, guys that have had that surgery from Amari Stoudemire to Penny Hardaway, they'll tell you that you you have to become a different player. You have to become a different player. I, I think people would be blown away, uh, although it's a super popular sort of beaten to death content intro of kids don't remember. But your three point shooting, I mean, touching on 40 percent, over 40 yeah. percent the last year there with Miami, like there just weren't it wasn't like you were taking one a game either, you know, like. Yeah, that, th these are impressive three point numbers for somebody who started off as just murdering the rim. Yeah. You know what? You know what I found was, is that when I had that microfracture surgery and also getting down to the Miami Heat and being the third scoring option, I had to figure out where my spots were going to be, where I can be effective. And what I figured out was, was Alonzo Mourning was going to get double teamed in the post. So I used to always shoot to the other side of the corner. So I worked specifically on corner threes because, you know, as the ball swung, they're going to be running out at that corner, man. And that's probably the easiest three point shot uh, to take and make uh, in the NBA because it's actually a little bit closer than when you get around the, the arc part of it. Sure. So um, that that's where I established that. So um, 
you know, for me, I was very dialed in into the detail and the specific part of it because I couldn't do a lot of physical activity. So I had to be mentally, uh, mentally on it and really figure out how can I adjust. Final thing before we let you go, um, March is CRC month. This is a big part of your media availability. Yeah. Uh, it's a cancer that I know that you are um, definitely passionate about. So tell us more about what you're doing. Yeah. So I partner with Exact Sciences to to really spread awareness for people that are 45 and older um, to get to get searched, to get understanding, to get to get their screening done. Um, you can go to boxoutcoloncancer.com for more information and why it's near and dear to my heart. And I don't, you know, you know me better than anybody in this media world, Ryan. I don't do a lot of things. You know what I mean? I'm not readily available and not really a big media guy, but this touched me from the standpoint that my mom dealt with colon cancer and that was my 2003 all-star year. And um, my mom was in remission for 18 years, uh, passed away, not from colon cancer, but from a heart issue pre-COVID. So I've always been on the mission ever since she passed to honor her and spread the message of things that we experience together that can help other people. That's what she would want me to do. I'm an only child and I was raised by a single mother in Helen Mashburn. So anything that I can do that shares her experience, what we went through, and if we would have detected early, she probably wouldn't have to deal with some of the, had to deal with some of the healthcare obstacles, meaning like, uh, you know, feeling like when you're in the hospital and she was dealing with colon cancer, she felt like she was just a chart. She didn't feel like a human, you know? Um, and I think a lot of people experience that in our healthcare system. So I want people to get screened earlier if you're 45 and older, because it's a preventable uh, disease, you know? Um, and I think we often as men need to have more conversations about our health and our awareness of health and and really chat about it and not be so taboo because I'm under the impression that, you know, you want to be around here as long as possible for your loved ones, watch your grandkids grow up or, or have more of a time with your, your wife or girlfriend, whoever it is. So if there's things that are preventable, so that's why I partner with exact sciences to, um, to talk about the screening process. So box out colon If you want some information, my friend. Right. And on Twitter, uh, at exact sciences, uh, and at Blue Hats for Collins. And that is the number four. Hey, yep. this was far too long, man. It had been, yeah. it's been years. I don't know how that yep. happens. It's just what happens, but we'll stay in contact. And Please. thanks so much for doing this, Jamal. Appreciate man, it. thank you, Ryan, man. I appreciate you, man. You got the number, man. Use it, man. All right. Sounds good. We'll be in contact <laughs> soon. All right, man. Have a good one. Talk to you later.